But without further ado, let me briefly introduce uh, Yaron to you. Uh, I had the privilege of knowing Yaron for I don't know, almost two decades now. Uh, but Yaron is uh, the chairman of the Board of the Grant Institute and he wears many hats. But one of the hats that you will see uh, is the most prominent. It's a very good. He's a, an author and his books are being published in many languages. He is a very prominent speaker. And uh, listening to Neuron is always a pleasure. And I invite the audience here to really, really ask questions after this optimist talk. And uh, Neuron can also be heard at the Neuron Group Show, which airs live on YouTube. And as a speaker, as I already mentioned, many, many radio programs. Plus, that uh, he, of course, uh, has his uh, weekly comments. Uh, he's in Forbes, uh, where you can uh, read him. He has his Wall Street uh, um, every, every once in a while. And about the most important thing is his recent book, The Pursuit of Wealth, The Moral Case of Finance, uh, is definitely worth reading. So you will receive the box of books and you can buy them from the United Institute's website or the Austrian Economics website. And of course, this is all. But one thing that I would also ask Yaron to touch upon was his book on the equal is unfair. America's misguided uh, fight against uh, income inequality. And having gone through a crisis, a lockdown crisis now, uh, this issue will be discussed in Europe more than ever. So I invite you to also ask questions with regards to that topic. Thank you very much for coming. Like to Vienna. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Joe. Take this up, please. So, yes, we've just gone through quite a crisis. Uh, we've gone through a period of time where governments have felt that they can lock us down, tell us to stay home. And the shocking thing is not so much that governments did that. I think what's really shocking is that we all accepted it. That country after country after country in the world agreed to the Chinese style lockdowns. And no protests, no objections, nobody stood up, nobody tried to defend a basic fundamental liberty, which is to live your life. What the last, I think, 18 months have illustrated is I think the trend that we've been experiencing now for, I think, 20 years. A real steady decline in liberty in the West, freedom in the West. There was a period, not that long ago, for some of us, some, some of you might be too young, but for some of us, there was a period not that long ago where the prospects of freedom and liberty seemed uh, incredibly rosy. They seemed incredibly positive. The Berlin Wall came down. Eastern Europe was liberated. It seemed like the West had won. You know, if you think about the 20th century, fascism was defeated, communism was defeated, and we end the 20th century with a real real energy and a real thrust towards what seems like more freedom and more liberty. In Western Europe, you had uh, Albert Thatcher, in the United States, you had Ronald Reagan, who revitalized the ideas of limited government. Not quite as much as some of us would have liked, but okay. don't you miss Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher? God, as compared to anybody in the respect of today. So, we went through a 20th century which appeared like the old collectivism was dead and we were moving into an era of individual liberty and individual freedom. And now I think most of that turned out to be a delusion. But existentially, we have lived now 20 years of a clear move and decline away from that, not just in practice. Because I think in practice, we never moved that far towards freedom. But now in theory as well. 
There's a greater, larger and larger movement today advocating for a variety of forms of collectivism. That's true in America, right? that's true in Europe, that's true, I mean, think about Australia right now. I always thought Australia was a free country. You know, you can't leave Australia. You're not allowed to fly out of Australia. Australia citizens are not allowed to leave Australia. Um, you can't leave Melbourne, five mile radius from your home. Sydney has been in lockdown for 120 days. This is supposedly a free country. But individuals can't make decisions about their own life, about their own risk tolerance, about what they can and cannot do on a daily basis. If you go out and demonstrate, I don't know if you've seen the pictures, of Australian police beating up demonstrators in the streets of Sydney and the streets of Melbourne. It, and these are demonstrators demonstrating for what? For revolution? No. These are demonstrators demonstrating for, they want to go back to work. They want to start living their lives. But this has been coming for 20 years. And it's interesting because we're in September 2021 now. 20 years ago was, of course, the, the, the event that marked 20 years ago was 9 11. And 9 11, I think, Begun the explicit, the obvious, the 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 the, the perceptual level, if you will, a slide away from any liberty, freedom. Nine eleven represents the beginning of the surveillance state of our rights being violated in a variety of different ways. Anybody remember when you went to the airport, you went to the gates, and you got on the plane? Remember those days? And people would come, they'd, they'd send you off, and, and you'd kiss and say goodbye at the gate just before you entered the airplane. Now you have to go two hours in advance, you have to take off your shoes, you have to, you know, take out your computers, why exactly? Nobody could tell you, right? One guy wants to try to smuggle a bomb in his shoe, and it didn't work, but now we all have to take off shoes. Somebody wants to try to sneak something, but now we all, it doesn't matter. And, and they can't evaluate you as an individual, they can't screen you in any kind of quick way. No, we all have to do it. I've seen six-year-old girls being patted down because they might be carrying a suicide vest. A six-year-old girl, really. So, starting in 9-11, the government took on, in the United States, we got the largest reshuffling of government, we got the Homeland Security um, Department, the TSA, the whole mechanism, the NSA, they're listening right now, so be careful what you say. Um, well, don't be careful what you say because it doesn't really matter, they're listening anyway. Um, the national security, right, the, 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 the guys who listen in, the, the, the listen, it turns out they were listening to emails of Americans, they were listening to our phone calls, collecting our emails, and of course now I'm overseas, so they legitimately could be, could be listening. Um, but they're listening in the US as well. So we saw the beginning of that slide. We got a, a, a President Bush, Republican, right, uh, who grew government spending, even if you put aside defense, dramatically. Yes, he cut taxes, but everything else, all government spending went up. We got the largest increase in the regulatory state. You guys don't know this in Austria, but we got Sovereign's Oxley, right, this massive bill, a ridiculous increase in the regulatory state in the United States during the Bush administration. And then, right, so we get, we get this slow decline, wars, security, uh, invasion of our privacy, massive regulatory bills, huge amounts of government spending, and then we get a financial crisis. And what is the world blaming the financial crisis on? Was, was, who caused the financial crisis? Capitalism, right? Free markets. All those free markets that existed in the 2000s caused it, right? So 2007, we had laissez-faire capitalism, and then we got we got a financial crisis in 2008 because of the laissez-faire capitalism. I mean, the, the, the stupidity of the argument that capitalism caused the financial crisis is mind-boggling, and yet the whole world has bought into that idea. Everybody today knows that banks, capitalism, free markets, Cause the financial crisis. So, what's the response to the financial crisis? More regulation, more government spending, more intervention in our freedom, in our liberties. More government, you know, bigger and bigger government, less and less limited. 
And again, you see this across the entire world. And China, by the way. I think China, I think the financial crisis is a key time for China. I think up until the financial crisis, they generally want a path to liberalization. They would generally believe, there was a belief in China, that capitalism was the future, that that's, that was, that's what success meant. And then they saw the West collapse financially, blame it on capitalism, and they said, well, we don't want that. And you start seeing the beginnings of the shift in 29, 2009, 2010, more state intervention, and today, of course, China is becoming all out of authoritarian. So, this, so you have three events, I think, three key events over the last 20 years, 9-11, financial crisis, and COVID. All bolstering the case of collectivism, state intervention, unlimited government, reduction in individual liberty, and freedom. And what's amazing about it is that those trends over the last 20 years come from both left and right. The whole question of left and right used to be, we used to have this vague idea that the right represented free markets and the left represented socialism. But if you look at the American right, the American right over the last 20 years has represented big government, lots of government spending, and a state that monitors what you do because of fear of terrorism. It's always fear of something. And you see an entire political party that used to at least talk free markets. They didn't do much other than maybe rape. Talk free markets completely shift to today. The Republican Party stands for industrial policy. There's the Nationalist Conservatives, industrial policy. Managed economies. Increased government spending. There's no talk of shrinking deficits, shrinking spending, shrinking government, limiting government in any kind of way. Expansion, expansion, expansion. And anti, you know, anti-immigration, and it's not just illegal immigration, anti-immigration. There's almost no immigration right now today in the U.S. And generally a retreat from any ideas of individual. You've got a left that's gone way to the left with wokeism and cancel culture, and you're not allowed to say this, and you're not allowed to say that, and if you do, we fire you. And, uh, and a left that has become completely intolerant of any ideas that deviate from some kind of religious dogma that they have adopted, right? the, whether it's uh, critical race theory or whether it's intersectionality. They change the name of these things every few years, but it's basically the same thing. It's the idea of victimhood. The idea that we should all sacrifice for the victims, whoever they define as the victim of the world. When we look at the political uh, landscape today, we basically, in the U.S., you look at the U.K., I mean, um, Boris Johnson is a conservative. Conservatives used to stand for what? Well, they used to stand for at least a semblance of, nothing radical, right? But a semblance of, you know, free markets, resistance to the left, uh, reforming the welfare state, making it smaller and more efficient, right? Lower taxes, generally. At least in America, they're very good at lower taxes. It's the only thing that the public is good for is lower taxes. What has Boris Johnson done since he became prime minister? Well, locked the Brits up. He's just announced he's increasing taxes. He's, uh, he followed all employees in, in the UK during COVID. So everybody got a check. Every Brit got a check. So there's lots of money in the economy right now. But shortage of labor. There are no workers. Can't find workers. I was, I, I was interested in London. You talk to restaurant owners. You talk to shop owners. They can't find people to work because people are getting checks from the government. And even when they stop getting checks from the government, they got used to not working. It's hard to go back to work. It's slow. Expanding the NHS, National Health Service, which is a religion in the UK. You'd think the Conservatives would want to shrink it, privatize pieces of it. No, he wants to grow it. And the big thing that Boris Johnson is very excited about is converting uh, the UK to 
what my uh, friend Alex Epstein calls unreliable energy. Solar. Can you imagine solar in, in, in England? Have you ever been to England? I mean, it's much worse than Austria even in terms of how little sunshine they get. They want to put solar and wind all over England as if that is the solution. Right? It's a little bit like your neighbor. Uh, I don't know what, what, what's going on in Austria, but Germany is the caricature. Right? They went to solar and, and wind, shut down, shut down uh, nuclear, eliminated nuclear completely. And what's happening? They're having to restart old coal plants because they don't have enough energy. So the Brits want to copy Germany or they want to do it even worse. And this is, again, a conservative, supposedly, market-oriented political party. And you can see this over and over again throughout the Western world. There is nobody even speaking the language of free markets. Nobody talking about deregulating, shrinking the state, getting the state out of our economic lives. They're just not there. I mean, the, the political parties that seem to be successful these days are, you know, center-right, center-left, middle of the road, technocrats who tinker a little bit here and tinker a little bit there and change a little bit here and change a little bit there. But are not actually doing anything. Are not actually changing anything. Are not thinking long-term. In the meantime, most governments in the West are accumulating debt at an unprecedented level. Printing money, the central banks are, are creating money at an unprecedented level. Nobody knows where this experiment is going, of zero and negative interest rates. Now, I know people have been warning about this for 10 years, but at some point, there's a price to pay. I think we're paying it right now. We're paying it with zero economic growth, which is what the European Union is experiencing, what the United States is experiencing, what most of the Western world is experiencing. So I keep moving out of the camera. Um, I mean, even China is now reporting low numbers of economic growth, which is not surprising. So we're experiencing it in the things that didn't happen. But a lot worse can happen, given our policies. Nobody in the political world today is speaking up against it. There's no voice, there's no political party representing that. There's no voice, no political parties standing up against the lockdowns, I mean, there were more competing about when you lock and who locks and vaccines versus masks versus this versus which mandate. But who is standing up against mandates, against lockdowns? I mean, we're all adults. I know they, 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 they find it hard to believe that we're all adults. Why can't we make decisions about our own health, risk factors, how much risk we're willing to take? If you carry the virus, you should stay home. And if you don't stay home and you carry the virus, then the state has a role to prevent you from infecting other people. But if you're not carrying the virus, if you test negative, then it's you're innocent. The state has no business with you. The state shouldn't be able to tell you what you can and cannot do. Isn't that the whole principle of liberty? If you're not a threat to other people, the state has no business in your life. So, if you think about it, what the state should have done at the beginning of the pandemic, and the state has a role in the pandemic, is to test, trace, isolate, which is what the Taiwanese did, and they've had almost no COVID. Because every time there's a little bump, they test, trace, isolate, they isolate the people who have it, leave everybody else alone. And people wear masks, not because they're told to wear masks, but because the Asians have a, you know, they, they wear masks during flu season. So they just wear masks. But they're expected to take responsibility over their own lives. We're not, somehow, in the West. We are treated as one blob of a collective, as mindless, ignorant, irresponsible, just waiting for the authoritarians in charge to tell us what we can and cannot do, you know, what we have, can and cannot wear, what diplomas we have to show in order to get into restaurants, in order to do business, because the restaurant owner can't decide for themselves what risk they're willing to take. So we've seen over the last 20 years a dramatic increase in state control, state intervention, but more than that, 
Because I think the really scary part of the last year and a half for me has been the people's response. More than that, we've seen people accept the role of the state in their lives. Whether it's accepting that 9-11 requires all the security, or whether it's accepting that COVID requires that we all get locked up. We've just been, in a sense, dumbed down. But what we've really been told is that we don't, we don't have to take personal responsibility, and we don't need to take personal responsibility. Somebody else is taking care of it. And in a sense, what we're seeing in the last 20 years is the ultimate victory of the collectivists, who we thought we beat. It turns out that we never actually crushed them and beat them. Because I don't think we ever conceptualized the battle right. So what is it that characterizes communism and fascism and our political parties today on the left and on the right, and the people's response out there, what is it fundamentally that characterizes all these statist, anti-freedom points of view, left, right, center, doesn't really matter. What characterizes them is they're all collectivists. They all don't actually care about the individual. You know, some of them do it in the name of the state, some of them do it in the name of the race, some of them do it in the name of the proletarian, and some of them do it in the name of the public good or the common interest or whatever. But all of them don't actually care about you as an individual, don't believe you can take care of yourself, and try to dumb you down to convince you that you can't take care of yourself because that's when you'll turn to them. Because if you're convinced you can't take care of yourself, then you need somebody to tell you what to do. What is really one is in spite of the fact that we defeated communism and fascism, what's really won is the fundamental collectivistic idea behind communism and fascism. We call it something different. And if you think about in the U.S., and I don't know how much you get the, the critical race theory and the, all this stuff here in Europe, but, I mean, that's collectivism 101. You all should be defined by the race, by the color of your skin. I mean, they are resurrecting racial theory in a way that is unbelievably shocking. I mean, they are, you are defined by your race. I mean, if a white person said what they are saying, they would be called a Nazi. Again, collectivism, you as an individual don't matter, what you do doesn't matter, your mind doesn't matter, what matters is what somebody believes is the interest of the group. And this is the rise of tribalism we're seeing all over the place. Where people, and again, you're seeing the tribalism on the left with, you know, these kids who do critical race theory, they don't understand what the hell they're talking about. They have no concept of it. They've been given a formula, they've been given somebody who told them what to do and what to say and how to say it, and they can go do it. And you're seeing on the right with people mindlessly repeating talking points they heard on Tucker Carlson or by Donald Trump the day before, and now they're just repeating them. They don't know what they're talking about. But on both sides, it's just mindlessness, because that's what collectivism is. Because collectivism is the theory that says the individual doesn't matter, the group does. And what we need to do is do what's good for the group. But how do we know what's good for the group? Because the group doesn't talk. The group doesn't think. There's no collective consciousness. Where is the good of the group? Where do we find it? Well, we need somebody to articulate it for us. I mean, that's why all groups need leaders. Right? I mean, how do we know what the Aryan race wants? Oh, we need a Fuhrer for that. He communes with the spirits of the Aryan people, and he tells us what they want. But how do we know what the proletarian wants? The proletarian have, don't have a voice. There's no proletarian mind. They need a leader. They need a Stalin to commune with the spirit of the proletarian and speak to us and tell us what, who needs to be sacrificed to whom. It's always about sacrifice. Yeah. And how do we know what critical race theory or whatever, whatever these things were? We need a leader. Collectivism always leads to authoritarianism. There's no other out. And the people in the middle, the moderates, they can postpone, they can delay, you know, because they have this general feeling that authoritarianism is bad. But they're playing right into the game 
because they're just tinkering at the edges instead of standing for the opposite of collectivism, which is what? What's the alternative to collectivism? It's individualism. But and individualism is what made the West the West. Individualism is the idea that individuals have the capacity to take care of themselves, the capacity to know the truth, the capacity to choose their values, and the moral standing to do so, that their lives matter, that their lives, in a sense, are the only thing that matters. Each individual as a separate being. The sanctity of that individual life. If you think about the Enlightenment, which I think is the birth of the ideas of freedom and the ideas of liberty that I think everybody in this room embraces. I mean, the origins of those, at least in the modern era, are in the Enlightenment in the 18th century. What are the, what are the key discoveries of the Enlightenment? Well, basically two. One is that each one of us has the capacity to discover truth. We have reason. Each individual. Truth is not revealed. Truth is not in ancient books. Truth is not something only some people have. But truth is something that anybody can discover using a particular method. The method of logic. The method of observing reality. The method of understanding. Of integrating. Of using reason. And everybody has it. And now, today, I say that, but yeah, okay. But think about the 18th century, right? In the 18th century, you don't get to choose anything as an individual. Why? Because you don't know anything. You're assumed to be too ignorant and too incapable of knowledge. Truth comes from the experts. The experts happen to be priests at that time, or happen to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, kings or queens or emperors or whatever. They tell us how to live. How do you, how do you what, what, what's your profession? How, how is your profession determined? Back then. I mean, you get to do what you want to do. You have to choose. Or if you're a woman, you still don't get to choose, right? You have no profession. You have no profession. Women are not professionals. They're not, they don't have jobs. And men, how do, how, do, how, do you, how do you get to choose your profession? Well, in most places, you do what your father did. You join the guild, right? Whatever your father did, you do. One of the most fascinating facts, everybody know Leonardo da Vinci? One of the great geniuses of all time. Why did Leonardo da Vinci get to be a painter and an engineer and an architect and an advisor and all these things? How, how, how come, like in the Renaissance, why didn't he just do what his father did? Like he was supposed to become an, uh, a uh, notary. Notary, that was, you know, witness documents and sign. Right? Why didn't Leonardo da Vinci become a notary like his father? What made him what made it possible for him to have this amazing career that we all benefit from to this day? Anybody know why Leonardo da Vinci was different than anybody else? He was born out of wedlock. He was an illegitimate child. And therefore the guild wouldn't accept him as a notary. You had to be a legitimate child in order to join the guild. So he was free because he was a bastard. I mean, that's incredibly cool, right? But you had to be a bastard to be free. Everybody else. Imagine you're not the waste of all the Leonardo da Vinci's who got to be notaries because they were born to a father and mother, right? To a, to a married couple. But that's the world. You didn't get to choose your profession. You didn't get to choose who to marry. You didn't get to choose who your leaders were. You didn't get to choose pretty much anything. You were born pretty much with about the same wealth as you died with I mean, most people. And that was it. If the, the king decided there was a war, you went to war. If the king decided something else, you did whatever your lord told you to do. And then suddenly, in Europe, in this 18th and 19th century, suddenly individuals discover that they have a mind. They literally discover that they can discover the truth. But a big part of this is, is people like uh, Newton teaches us that we can explain the physical world. And if we can explain the physical world, why can't I choose my profession? I've got a mind. 
I understand what's going on in the world. I'm just as smart as these other guys. Why can't I choose who to marry and hate? Why can't I choose who my political leader should be? I mean, literally, it's the birth of reason. The Enlightenment is called another name for the Enlightenment. It's often called the age of reason. It's the rebirth of reason, the rediscovery of reason that makes possible political freedom because suddenly it says, you have a mind. Therefore, you can be an agent. Therefore, you can act. You are responsible. Because up until that point, the assumption was what? We all don't know the truth. We can't discover the truth. What philosopher teaches us that? We're just in a cave. We see shadows. Plato. Plato taught us. And, and Western history is dominated by Plato, basically from Greece on. But we can know the truth. The truth is in another dimension. It's in the world of forms. Only certain individuals, the philosopher kings, can commune with the world of forms. And then they come back into the cave and they tell us what reality really is like. And maybe they help us see the light. But we as individuals can't do that. We're just watching shadows. We're too incompetent. So we can't make choices. And if you read Plato's Republic, it's about the most of the Maturian, you know, state ever. Right? I mean, he has nothing on the communists. Everything is regulated. Everything is controlled. Why? Because people are too dumb to take care of themselves. So somebody has to take care of them. Plato cares. So we discover that, no, Plato's wrong. Aristotle turns out to be right. Aristotle is Plato's student. Aristotle goes, ah, no. There's no world of forms. It's just mysticism. It's just, you, you can't prove that. This is knowledge. Knowledge is right here. We can see it. Our senses are valid. You know, we can use our minds. We can discover truth. Aristotle is the first real scientist, in a sense, puts together something. He's wrong about almost all his science. But his method is basically the right method. So, in a sense, in the Enlightenment, it's a rediscovery of Aristotle. It's a bringing in of Aristotle into life. And a rediscovery by everybody of Aristotle's ideas. Of the idea that we're efficacious. We can know truth. And then... If we can know truth, if we can make choices, if we can live, then what do we want to live for? Oh, we want to live to be happy. I mean, the first conceptions, this idea of being happy as an individual, start arising during this period. And we say, yeah, I can make choices in my life in a way that will make me happy. That's my job in life. So you get this individualism, right? I'm capable of achieving success, and I want to be successful. I want to live. I want to make choices about how to live. And out of that comes the whole liberal revolution. The whole revolution of political freedom comes out of that. Starting in 1776 and sweeping across Europe and the rest of the world over the next 200 years. But it's all in the name of this New philosophy, really a philosophy of individualism, of the value of the individual, and the value of his freedom. Because in order for me to use my mind, in order for me to use my mind in order to pursue the values that I need in order to be happy, what must I be? What must be eliminated from the world so I can think, act, in pursuit of my judgment, my values, my happiness, what must be eliminated from the world. Force, coercion, authority. And there's a concept for that. There's a concept for that that they came up with in, in, uh, in the Netherlands and John Locke solidified. And that concept is individual rights. Individual rights are not implanted in us. They're not something we're just born with magically. Individual rights are the conditions under which we as human beings thrive, survive in a social context. When other people are involved, we need protection from them because some of them are bad guys. 
Rights recognize the fact that you, every one of us, should, in a social context, should be free to pursue his life, to act on behalf of his life, free of courage and free of force. Rights are just a recognition of freedom. That freedom is the way we should live. Freedom is the appropriate way of living for individual human beings. And for a while, Western civilization swung towards individualism. And the benefits were massive. We, you know, became unbelievably rich. Right? Deirdre McCluskey says that what? We made 300 times richer than we were 200 years ago, 250 years ago. That's a way, way underestimating. I've talked to you about this. You agree with me? Way underestimating. Because that's just in dollar terms. But in quality of life, we're a gazillion times. You can't measure how much better our lives are today because of this movement towards freedom and individualism that has occurred over the last 250 years. Just think of how much, uh, you know, where in that calculation do you put having a toilet? Running water. You, you can't measure that. We don't buy that stuff, really. It was capital investment made a long, long time ago. So it, it doesn't count in the 300, multiple of 300. Right? Or how much... You know, when I count the iPhone, this is this is considered this is a thousand dollars, right? It costs a thousand dollars. So how does an economist view what's the value of this? Well, the only thing we can do as economists is measure the value of this as a thousand dollars because that's how much I paid for it. But how much is this worth to me? Much more than a thousand dollars. And if you think about it, what it would take to replicate this fifteen years ago, we're talking about millions of dollars. And even then, you probably couldn't get away with it, right? And what is the value of my ability to sit in Vienna and read a bedtime story to my, to my son in California? I'm making this up because my son is long gone out of the house. So, but, you know, what's the value of that? You can't measure that in dollars? <laughs> you can't measure it in dollars. So, but it's more than 300 times. So it's thousands and thousands. Our life today is so good. And we have no appreciation for that. For the, for the material value that we have today. All the result. Freedom. Freedom is a result of individualism. But you see, nobody has defended that individualism. Immediately, when the Enlightenment ends, The forces, the collectivistic forces, start up attacking the values of individuals. Whether it's Rousseau, Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Marx, Nietzsche, they're all anti individuals They're all collectivists. I mean, Hegel, what's the greatest value for Hegel? Social. The state. We're all supposed to be absorbed into the state. That's the key. Individuals don't matter to any of these philosophers. And it's a broadside attack against the Enlightenment, against Aristotle. Plato will not die. Plato keeps coming back. And we today are cruising along on some of the values and virtues of the Enlightenment, on some of these ideas of individualism that some people out there still have a little bit of. But they're being eroded, they're being chipped away at constantly by the forces at our universities, as our schools, our intellectual forces, constantly talk in terms of collectives, in terms of what's good for the state, for the country, for the group. And again, they define the group differently every time, but it's always at the expense of the individual. It's always the case that the individual is expected to sacrifice for some group. And again, the right has its groups, the left has its groups. So what we need, I think our mission is, is to resurrect the idea of individualism. It's to bring it back. It's always been to fight for the Enlightenment values. It's to reject collectivism. All kinds of collectivism. Not just the ones we happen to dislike at the moment. If you look at the political map today, left and right, I, I find myself 
hating them, at least in the United States, almost equally. They each want to violate my IA rights. They each want to control me. They each want to step on me. They each don't care about me and you as individuals. And the whole conception of left and right, which comes out of some silly thing in the, I guess, French parliament right after this, right after the uh, French Revolution, where the people who sat on the right were X and the people who sat on the left were something else. Came out, comes out of that. It's not ideological. It's not fundamental. I am, I've come to the conclusion it needs to be scrapped completely. This whole, because it feeds into as if there's an opposition, right? They're all collectivists. So they should all be grouped together. So I'd like us to see it, us redraw the political landscape. Collectivism over here and individualism over here. And put all the collectivists together where they belong. Communists and fascists can be side by side. Because they're both the same thing. And all the different variations of collectivism, the socialists and the various nationalists of various forms. Everybody who wants the nationalist in the sense of state above individual. The nationalists who want to sacrifice you for the sake of some idea of the state. All of them should be on the spectrum. And then there's nobody over here, which is sad. But that's our goal. Our goal is to get us over here. And over here is individualism. Over here is where the state is there to be our servant. Our servant to doing what? Protecting our freedom. That's it. There's no role for the state other than to protect our rights. Leave us alone. We can figure out viruses. Indeed, the solution to viruses is not coming from the state. It's coming from private individuals. Turkish immigrants in Germany discovered the Pfizer vaccine. Right? I mean, children of Turkey. Those evil Turks. They're the ones who came up with the Pfizer vaccine. Moderna. Anybody know how long it took Moderna and in, in, uh, in, uh, BioNTech in Germany? How, how long from the day the Chinese put up the DNA of the virus? How long did it take them to have the formula for the vaccine? A month, two months, a year? Well, less than a year because we had the vaccine in here. Two days. Literally two days. Because they had the platform, they plugged in the DNA, and they got two days, they got the vaccine. In a month, they had the liquid. They actually had a vaccine. They sent it to the FDA for, uh, you know, uh, uh, animal trials, safety. By June of last year, we had vaccines that were safe. They'd been tested for safety. They hadn't been tested for efficacy, for whether they would work. But they were safe. By June of last year. Now imagine a free market. Imagine a world in which we didn't have to beg the government to approve what we thought was healthy for us. Imagine a world in which the drug companies came to us and said, look, we've got a vaccine. This thing is killing hundreds of thousands of people. Anybody who wants it will provide it. You know, here are the risks. They are risks. We've tested it to the best of our ability. We think it's safe. You know, maybe they even have you sign a release of liability. And then most of us wouldn't do it. God, it's an experiment of God. We don't. But some of us, maybe like me, who are first adopters, would go and get vaccinated, and you all would watch. Ooh, he hasn't died yet. He's still standing. And he, okay, so more people. And by December, when the FDA finally got around to approving the vaccine, Half of us would have been vaccinated. You would have saved hundreds of thousands of lives. And that's how a free market works. It assumes that you can make decisions for yourself and that people can negotiate. And yeah, some people make stupid mistakes. Okay, so they make stupid mistakes and they suffer the consequences usually. But no, those kind of choices are beyond us. We can't make decisions for ourselves. We need a, a board of supervisors to decide who gets vaccinated, when, how much. And we need the government to buy all the vaccines because we can't buy them for ourselves. Our businesses can't buy them. Insurance companies can't buy them. Hospitals can't buy them. The government has to buy all the vaccines and then distribute them. And they're very good at that. We know how well the you know, governments are distributing stuff. In the United States, compare how the vaccine was distributed by the U.S. government versus how Walmart distributes stuff every single day. Or Amazon gets packages to my door within 24 hours. 
Imagine if Amazon was in charge of distributing the vaccine. It would have been a complete game changer. And yet, nobody even thinks about that. It's inconceivable in the world in which we live. Where the assumption is, again, we as individuals don't matter. You can't make decisions for ourselves. So we need to redraw the political map. We need to call the political parties that exist today what they really are. They're all collectivists. Some of them are moderates. So they're not quite as authoritarian as others, but they're still collectivists. I mean, to start drawing up who are the individuals? Do they exist out there? How do we create? How do we educate people about the value of individualism? It's not that long ago that, at least in America, people thought that that was a good thing. That's changed. America's changed over the last 20 years. I moved to America 34 years ago, and I've seen this dramatic decline over the last 34 years, not just in the politics, not just in the economics, but in the spirit of people. I came right at the end of the Reagan administration where there was an optimism, a positivism, an individualism, a can-do attitude, an entrepreneurial attitude. And most of that is gone. It's sad to see. But the U.S. has become, I don't want to insult you guys, but it's become like you. It's lost what it was to be American, which was that individualistic spirit. So that's the new political spectrum. What we need to rediscover are the ideas of that enlightenment. The ideas that I think are represented in what I think is the most important political document ever written, which is the Declaration of Independence and that was written by Thomas Jefferson. And the idea there was, it was not that we're creating this new state, this new country for the common good and the public interest. So we can sacrifice some people to others. None of that is in the Declaration of Independence. Indeed, that's what they're rebelling against. This country was founded on the idea that what matters are individuals. The country was founded on the idea that governments is as instituted for one purpose and one purpose only. To protect those individuals. To protect their rights. And it's stunning, right? A whole country was founded on moral, ethical idea of individual rights. Of the fact that individuals should be free because that's the appropriate way for people to live. That's the only appropriate way for people to live. I mean, nobody could write a document like that today and be taken seriously. But that's what we need to rediscover. That's what we need to fight for. The right to life. To live your life as you see fit, based on your judgment, based on your values. No authority can tell you what to do and what not to do. Unless you're a threat to other people, nobody has a business in your life. The right to liberty. Each one of us has a right to think, write, speak. And nobody has a right to stop us, block us. Interfere, use force against us, tell us some thoughts, unacceptable. Well, they can tell us, but they can't do anything about it. We have a right, they cut this out, but we have a right to property, to earn our own living, and to keep it, and to, to use it as we see fit. There's no property rights anymore. We have to get environmental approval for everything you do on your own property. You have to get the state's approval, what you build on your own property. Well, why is it yours? If they need to approve what you do. I have to have government inspectors to come in if I renovate. If I cut, chop down a tree in California, you need permission from the state. In what sense is it my property? I'm just leasing it from the government. I need permission from them to do anything. And try not to pay property taxes and suddenly discover that you're only paying rent. Sign yours. And, of course, we all work hard. We make a living. And then... Half of it's gone before it even reaches us. Property. What right to property do we have in the modern state? 50%, over 50% is not yours. And they could raise it any time. They could take it whenever they want. There's no principle that says that it's your money. And indeed, the way politicians even talk about taxes, they talk about, you know, how much they're leaving you. 
right? It's as if it's their money and they're they're nice guys, and you get to keep forty percent. Isn't that nice of them? They've got everything upside down again. They're assuming, like the kings did, that everything is theirs, and oh, I'm letting you use it right now. Be happy, because I'm letting you. That's the attitude of everybody. To have a right to life, to liberty, to property. And maybe most importantly, you have a right to pursue your happiness. It's your life, your values, your mind, your judgment, your decisions. And that's what we shouldn't be really fighting for. It's the right to pursue happiness. That's something I think we inspire young people around. They've got a whole future in front of them. And who's going to make them happy? I mean, we're at the Hayek Institute. So, I mean, Hayek said that it, it's a problem of calculation. And it is a problem of calculation, central planning, right? But it's much more than a problem of calculation. It's a problem of fundamental knowledge. Nobody knows how to make me happy except me. Nobody knows how to make you happy except you. There is no meta-knowledge that says your values have to be X, Y, Z. You have to do this to be happy. You have to make those decisions. And if somebody else imposes those things on you, they're not yours, and therefore they won't make you happy. <coughs> Happiness is personal. Values are personal. <coughs> so it's not just an issue of calculation. It's an issue of you can't even get the data. Often we don't even know exactly what our values are. Part of life is figuring them out. So, a vision of the pursuit of happiness, a vision of individualism, a vision of freedom is what we need to be fighting for. Coalitions with the existing political whatever, I think, are a waste of time and worse than that. They compromise us. The challenge is how do we shift the debate, the discussion, and start fighting for what really matters. And that's freedom and individual. Thank you.